Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast. I'm your host, Mark Sheff. And if you're watching this video, you will notice a little bit of a shiner right here. I do love jujitsu, and I will say that this week it loved me back just as hard. So this week's guest is a little bit different from my usual guest. He's actually got a long career in healthcare, and he now works with all kinds of businesses, startups, entrepreneurs, taking them from zero to 10K, 10K to 100K. But what's so interesting is he really thinks about this from a human perspective. And he talks in this podcast, we talk a lot about how to create a legacy through empathy and through a commitment to growth of the people around you. So what's so fascinating for me is even with somebody who's so different from me and, and just doing things you know that, that are so foreign to me in terms of his day to day, there's so many commonalities in terms of what we're trying to do as people who create things in the world. So have a listen and I'll see you on the other side. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Jamal, welcome to the show. Really good to have you here, man. Man, Mark, I'm so glad to be here, man. I'm glad to actually be getting the chance to get to know you more and more from talking to you. So I'm super excited to be a part of the podcast. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, you know, I gave a little intro before we got on the call, uh, but you know, yeah, I'd love to you to share with our listeners just a little bit about you and kind of what your mission is in the world. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my name is Jamal Ford. I'm a second generation entrepreneur. Um, I've been in the healthcare industry for probably about 12 years now. And for me, I've really um, hung my head on really trying to help people be more empathetic to their customers, empathetic to their employees, making sure that there's a good understanding and a good um, buy-in across the board on the products or the services that a company is offering. And I believe that once you do that, um, you're going to have a long lasting actual business compared to a business that is only for a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a long, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm looking at your bio here and you've got like a long rich history of working with uh, lots of different people. And, you know, when we talked earlier, you talked a lot about, or we, we spoke a lot about really the importance of, of an empathetic approach. Um, I'm curious, you know, it, how would you say an empathetic approach affects, you know, the course or the, you know, the course of success for, you know, either a small business or individual to, to, to something larger? Yeah. So one big thing that I always try to remember, whether it's me trying to start a new project or I'm working with a potential client that is um, creating a new project or trying to expand their particular business or project, I always think empathy over ego, because mm. I really believe that um, we sometimes get so locked into what we want to do that we don't consider what the market is asking us for or what our actual customers are asking us for. So I think it's a blend of understanding what people want, what your community wants, understanding what you have the tools to give them and actually being committed to giving them what they want in your own way. So I think it's a blend of the two. Yeah, I love that empathy over ego. Yeah, because right, it allows you to do the voice, you know, the kind of voice of customer work that whether you're in healthcare or, you know, if you're, a, a, you're running a creative agency or running your own business, which I would argue is a very creative pursuit, running a business, being an entrepreneur, you know, being willing to put yourself in the shoes of someone else, right? Well, I will tell you this, Mark, I 100 percent agree with that. And I think um, from a creative standpoint, it's, it's, it's also super important um, outside of the business standpoint. I actually have been um, a professional bass player for probably about 15 years. So I, okay. I played bass and um, even in my, my bass playing, I still play. I play at my local church and I, sometimes I play festivals or different things like that. And for me, I, as a musician, I've always said to myself, OK, I love to play. I can play all these licks. I can play all these things. But that's not what's important. The most important thing is that the actual crowd gets the message that the artist up there is trying to present. So it's very important for me all the time, even from that aspect, to get out of the way to be able to get the overall message that people came to receive out there. Sometimes even as a musician, you can want people to look at you and what you're doing and not see the big picture. So, I mean, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Something, you know, something that uh, it's reminding me of something that I read in uh, Donald Miller's book, the Building Your Story Brand book, you know, where he yeah. talks about the the sort of customer journey. And it's, 
you know, for me, when I was reading this as an artist, it's a little bit hard because you're like, uh, like, you know, it's not it's not the same kind of thing when you're talking about business. But there there are really ways to think about it. Like you're not the hero up yeah. there. Like you're 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 working, you know, with the whether it's with a crowd or with a company or, you know, however you're working, you're you're guiding them through through a journey. And they you know, they are experiencing some sort of transformation. I mean, look, I, I love music. I've, I've been to some live music. I'm, I'm I, not as much as probably a lot of people. But you know, when you're when you're there, and you are, you know, people talk about feeling transported, or transformed, you know, the the, the feel, you know, there's feelings and chemicals going on in your body when that stuff right. happens, all that stuff, like you're literally changing the chemistry of your body, like you're doing that for people out there, right? Yeah, 100% It's very much so super important from that um, standpoint. And even to go back, um, to what you were talking about before. One of the um, greatest examples of actual being an artist and trying to help people tell the story is actually the book Pinocchio. I like The book Pinocchio yeah. is like the ultimate example of that. I always think, people always think about Jiminy Cricket, right? And Jiminy Cricket responsibility was to guide Pinocchio to being a real boy, right? But one thing that people never consider is... Geppetto was the artist. Geppetto was the artist who created Pinocchio. And then that was his creation. Jiminy Cricket came in and said, hey, this is your creation. I want to make it better, but I can't force it. I have to guide it. And so I have right. to, I'm not the hero of the story. Pinocchio is the hero of the story. I can mm. only give him advice and tell him what to do, right? So I've always loved that example when it comes to actual, you're not the hero. And so when you talked about being an artist and not being a hero, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think even in the book, he mentions Jiminy Cricket. Now that you mention it, right, yeah. sort of the sort of the ultimate guide, like he literally doesn't have the, the, the physique to really, you know, make anything happen. But yeah. he's, he's this voice of he's the conscience, right? He's the voice of he's the voice of reason. He's the voice of purpose for for Pinocchio. Uh, I, I'd, ha I'd have to reread this. I have, it's been a while, I'll be honest. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know how 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 well it ages. But I think, um, you know, when I think about that position as a guide and, you know, bring it back to you, you know, that's what I hear. And, and we've talked. That's like what you do for a lot of your clients is really guide them, challenge them, push them through to, you know, bring bring more empathy to their communication, bring more collaboration and uh, and, and, and give them the tools that they then have to execute with. Right. Yeah. One hundred percent. I believe that really being in this particular space and being a thought leader in the space of consulting and business, you can really get hung up on what you believe is best for that company's, um, for that founder, for that uh, CEO, for that COO, right. and just tell them you should do this. Um, and for me, um, it's always said, teach a man to fish, I give a man right. a fish, right? So for right. me, I always step back and I, and many times, even as a consultant, you can see it like, it's like, do this, but that's not really your responsibility. Yeah. Your responsibility yeah. is to consult and to guide them to the answer. That way, when you're not there, they still know the pathway to get to the answer. Right. Um, yeah. But once again, empathy over ego, many times our ego gets in the way of us allowing the customer to be the hero you want the accolades for coming up with the answer. Right. So yeah. it's like, you know, so it, it can become um, a slippery slope. And I, I really believe that um, when you actually set us, like when you're working with an actual customer and you set a pathway, whether it be in the creative space or in the business space, when you put that roadmap together, that roadmap and you stick to it is going to allow you not to get in the way of the customer. So as a consultant, when I'm working with someone and I say, this is the goal that they have, and I put that roadmap in place, mm -hmm. I'm not the person that's coming up with the ideas in the roadmap. I'm helping guide them down that road, right? And so that way yeah. they can go back and forth down that road. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that actually is a nice segue into something that uh, that we talked about before is is that one of the things you said you you like to do is to you know when you're working with clients when you're consult well, consulting or co i mean there's a you know you can kind of as consultants sometimes you kind of go back and forth right you you 
you advocate for a culture of open collaboration and collective growth. So I'd love to hear, I mean, if, you, if you've got even a specific example of like, you know, uh, a, a, an individual again or, or an organization, you know, what, what happens when someone shifts that? Like, what, like are, there, are there tools? Like you talk about the roadmap. Like where does that fall on the roadmap? How does that, how does that sit within that framework? Yeah, so another thing I like to say, and I always like to bring into a consulting um, standpoint, if I'm working with a company as a whole and not maybe an executive, I always say caring culture succeed, right? So what that means is as the leader, of the company is not just about everybody seeing my vision, but it's about them seeing themselves in the vision of the company. One of mm. my favorite books um, is Extreme Ownership. And um, in Extreme Ownership, it really delves into um, the mission. And when you're in the army, there's a mission and you may not agree with what your commander is telling you to do. But if you go rogue, you may die, <laughs> right? So right, right. <laughs> the number one thing they tell you to do is, this is the mission. You have to find yourself within the mission. You have to say, what part of this mission I like? How can I really fully invest in this mission? And so for me, when I'm bringing on a team member or I'm working with someone that's bringing on team, um, team members, I always, once again, bring it back to the values of the owner of the business and then making sure that they understand the values of their employees. Because from there, the buy-in on both sides is very easy. When um, when I say uh, caring culture succeeds, it's easy for me to care about my employees and for my employees to care about me if we have the same value system, right? Mm -hmm. um, and going from that, caring even goes beyond the company. I'm really big on um, when I'm transitioning someone internally from a regular role to a leadership role. I never teach people how to be a leader strictly for my company or for that company. I teach them leadership skills overall, and then I tell them how these skills apply to this company, right? Mm -hmm. And that's for me, it's investing in them to where if they can have success beyond my company, I don't want to pigeonhole them to being with me. And I think it, it becomes tricky because when you find a quality worker, m many times we get so stuck, we don't want them to leave. We don't want them to leave. And so we do things as a company or as a business to try to make them want to stay or we don't invest in their success overall, mm. right? And yeah. um, it still is to the detriment of the company because- right. you're working the against next, the outcome, right? You're yeah. working against the outcome because you don't want them to leave. They're your best worker. You should be investing them in them, but that's like almost like a personal risk. Like if I- I, you know, if I'm if I'm creating this culture of openness, communication, I would I would offer a culture of coaching where you're invested in people's growth. You know, there's a chance that they may that they may grow beyond. I can I you know I can I can relate to this. Yeah, and and I think them growing beyond your company is great. It's it's great to say why is it great? I would love to hear. I would love to hear you yeah. say why. It's great. So for me, I it's great for a number of reasons, and I don't want to I don't want to. Like, uh, but for me, I, I'm really big on when a comp there's a few things that a company needs to have success and you need pipelines and you need two major pipelines for me. You need a pipeline of customers and you need a pipeline of employee. Um, cause those are the two things that really pigeonhole most companies. Um, so you want to find your target audience in a collective group. So like, let's say if I'm in the fitness industry, I'm going to go marketing to apartment complexes because I know there's eight, 900 people that stay in this apartment complex. And that's a huge funnel for me, right? If I'm working in, um, same thing, if I'm working in the fitness industry and I need uh, employees, I'm going to go to the local college and find kids who are um, maybe getting a degree in some sort of fitness, right? Mm. And if I put together a system of training that is spectacular. I can actually win awards for my company through this system, which mm -hmm. will attract even more employees. So really by because focusing, they, well, it really just by like focus, I'll say this, really focusing on that individual um, employee will ultimately stop your growth from being able to train fully 
to be able to train the rest of your employees, right? Um, and so I think that's super important to always consider. Like stopping someone else's growth is actually stopping your growth on a multitude of levels. Right. You know, there's, there's, I can, I can almost, I can almost hear the the comment section going. Well, what about, you know, what about employee satisfaction and all that other stuff? What I'm actually hearing you say is that it, by being dedicated to employee satisfaction, by offering opportunities for growth, by offering education, by offering, you know, the top, the most top quality training and opportunities and. And that kind of thing. I mean, you know, in my, you know, in my world, in my background as a creative, you know, I run an art gallery. It's, it's one of, <laughs> in fact, it's just happened today. It's, it's almost one of the greatest joys of, of owning and running this art gallery. When someone says, you know what, I've got bigger fish to fry now. Like I've grown out of the gallery. It's, we, we sell small work. We sell work every day. It's a great, I, I think it's a great place. People have great things to say about it. But every now and then, you know, an artist grows beyond where they say, you know what, my, my, my prices have gone up. They've gone up too far. I need to go to a bigger gallery. And I say, that's great because my mission isn't, isn't necessary. I mean, certainly there's like a bottom line somewhere, right? Like you, you, if you want to keep being in business, you got to attend to that. You got to make sure people are happy while they're there. But along the way, you know, if I'm, if I'm known as a place where people come and they and they end up in a better place when they leave, that's great. If I'm the place that just churns people out and people are burnt out when they leave, that's probably we're not talking about that. Yeah. Right? Like, you're not talking about not giving a crap about your employees. <laughs> right. One hundred percent. I agree. I will say even from that particular standpoint, in an even bigger picture, um, legacy yeah. in talking about legacy. Um, mm. Many people always want to figure out what their legacy is, what their business, what their business legacy is. And a legacy lives beyond you. It's something that goes beyond your physical time here and your, your human experience. Right. So for me, I always think if my legacy is to live on beyond me, I have to fully invest in others because word mm. of mouth, whether it be business, whether it be whatever, that is the number one thing that's always going to submit legacy. So when someone leaves, if someone leaves your art gallery and you've invested full time, full energy into them, they will always give you praise. And when they find those young creatives, those young people who are trying their best to find their way and they see the success of this person who left your art gallery, the very first thing that they're going to ask them, well, how did you get here? And your gallery is going to be the Number one thing that they say, because you put full energy into the success of that person. So I, I really believe that is legacy. That is why it's important to invest, whether it be in creatives or employees, because I want an employee to employees are going to leave regardless. Like they're going people get hired and fired all the time. Yeah, people we don't, we don't live in the culture of I mean, my dad's of the generation, you know, you get a job and you stick with it. And, and um, you know, that that time is gone for Mo, you know, a lot of a lot of professions. Yeah. And I would say even from that standpoint and even from the standpoint, I use what you said. You said that you, you sell smaller works because you sell smaller works that ha has probably a, a roundabout price range for those mm -hmm. works. And so generally when um, an artist gets recognition or starts to work on other things, that has to change, like whether the size of the work changes or the price point of the work changes. Those are all factors that has to happen in order for that artist to feel success. Right. Same thing with employees. An employee comes to work for you. They are at a level. And unfortunately, you know, inflation is 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 large. Like we have a lot of things that's going on as a company. You have to know not only your target audience, but your target employee, too. Right. And so. Like, in, are you a starter job? Are you a job that's for people in between the ages of 18 and 25? Are you a job for people between, you know, 26 to 35? Are you a job, and it gets very unique. Like, are you a job for single mothers? Um, one of my favorite, one of my favorite stories is a, a guy by the name of uh, Pat Bet David. I don't know if you're familiar with Pat. He's he's an insurance professional, and I think he sold his insurance company for like 350 million or something like that. Um, and he runs like these huge uh, actual uh, conferences now. He has uh, something called Valuetainment. But when Pat started his insurance company, he had trouble finding employees, and he actually niched down to Hispanic single mothers, and that was the people that he invested in because he understood 
that their income level wasn't where they needed it to be. And he had the resources and tools to give them the skill set to be able to get them to the next level. Right. And so I think that that's um, really important that he knew who his target employee is. So I think yeah. it's super important to understand that. That's it. That's a beautiful example. And and I got to say, you know, it's still ringing in my ears what you just said about legacy. I just think that's maybe one of the best, just one of the best uh, ways I've, I've really heard. Like if you, you know, if you want to have an impact in the world that goes beyond your time, your physical form, if you will, then you have to invest in others. You know, it's not about, it's it's, it's not, I, I like it because it's not, you know, it's not influence. It, it is in a way influence, but it's not about influence, power, and money. It's about investing in others on whatever scale, right? Like if yeah. you, you know, I, I've heard this and I, I'm, I'm going to have to look this up, but there's some sort of quote about like, you know, we live for as long as people remember us or, you know, something like yeah. that. And, and that's just a beautiful way of thinking about it, right? Like if we, if we, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson also said, and I'm going to, I'm going to blow this quote, but you know, he said basically like if we're, if we're truly here to serve others, then we have to invest in ourselves. So there's like two sides to that coin. Um, cause people often get kind of stuck in their minds about like, well, I'm do like, I want, I feel selfish about building this thing because I'm building myself up. But if you're doing that and you're investing that right back in others, then there's that beautiful sort of virtuous cycle. Um, if, if you will, um, if you're not, if you're not hoarding all of that, right. That's just, well, that's, but, a, that's, a, that's just, that really stood out to me as some, as a really beautiful way to phrase that. You know, one thing I will say about that, and this, this actual event really put it in perspective for me. Um, the death of the Queen of England, um, Queen mm. Elizabeth. When she passed, it probably was like eight or nine months, and people were not talking about her. At least in our in the United States society, people were not talking about her as much as maybe when she was alive. Right? Why is that important? She is the most successful monarch in human, almost in human history. I would say, at least from our some of what of recorded history um, outside of the Roman Empire, because. Her reign was about 70 years. And for England, it was the most financially successful time of the actual country. And she has a ton of accolades. But today, you know, as the world, we don't talk like maybe in England, they talk about her a good bit. But for us, we don't really mention her on a day to day. Right. And so legacy has a timeline. Legacy has certain things. And so. I don't want well, my legacy to be one day, right? I want my legacy. Right. I mean, it's also it, that example kind of brings the point, and and, and I, I might have a slightly different view on on what what success is, but certainly financially, like they they did, you know, the the, the royal family did yeah, yeah. great the last hundred years, and she reigned for seven. So by those metrics, certainly successful. You yeah. know, I, I'm not I'm not as up to date on on you know how she actually did serve over there, but right. I will say. You know, it's it's an interesting commentary that and not, not to get too political, but like money isn't money really isn't everything. It is an important factor in the success of a business. But what I'm what I'm hearing you say, like all the stuff we're talking about, legacy and communication and empathy. It's funny. I just feel like this is in the air now. Like people are really aware that, you know, there's only so far you can get by focusing on you know, on, on numbers, on, on getting people in the door, on getting employees in the door. If you're not focused on, and however this is going to sound, on, on really the human side of creating, whether it's a, in this world, right? Whether you're creating a business or whether you're creating relationships, you know, whether, whether it's work or personal, if you're not focused on the human side of the, the collaboration that you're having, whether, again, with a client, with a friend, with a partner, kids, if you're not focused on that human side, if you're just focused on these sort of traditional success metrics, yeah. I mean, in, there, there's people who are maybe dis disagree with me on that one, but in my yeah. mind, that's that's not a success to me. You know, but if no, I, 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 agree with you. If I have people leave and say, you know what, you help me get to the next level, even though we're not working together, right? You help me get to the next level. Like I got kids, right? And you know. Someday they may be grateful. They're not, you know, they're teen. You know, one's a teenager they're now. Kids so now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they still, they're still kids. They don't, they, you know, they hate me every other day. But you know, <laughs> I, I'd like to, th I'd like to think that somebody uh, uh, notices that, you know, we got them, we got them from really nothing to, you know, to being successful people in the world, and that's what I. I mean, parenting is like an amazing example of this. Like we, you know, it's it is it is not a profitable business. <laughs> you know, we yeah. are 
we are spending all kinds of money just to like just to invest in the growth. So that's like maybe yeah. too far in the other direction. But well, I don't think so. I, I will say, like, what you do, especially with the gallery, has such a profound impact on the idea of legacy because mm. being a creative and being able to tap into it kind of goes back into empathy. It kind of goes back into these things. When you're able to tap into society, what the what's going on in the world at that particular time, um, what what the experience, your human experience, everyone around you human experience, and you're able to create a piece of art that transcends time, that transcends mm. certain things. That's very impactful because when you leave, like even us, you doing this podcast, it's a form of art. It's a form of leaving um, something towards your kids. Um, it's also a form of um, being able to show people beyond your time frame here um, what you did, right? And so that's that's very important. I, I believe that at the end of the day, um, art, when done the right way, and when done with in the in the right, uh, I would say in the right spirit. I, I, I would use mm -hmm. that term. In, from the right perspective can really have an impact very profound, long beyond your time frame. You talk about great books, uh, um, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, the Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so yeah, many that's books. that's certainly a very good example yeah, of, like, uh, of like uh, meditations, <laughs> meditations of Marcus Aurelius, like those particular things, like, you know, they, they transcend time. I, I'll say this, and, and obviously if you want to transition to something else, that's cool, but I always say, like, um, the Roman Empire was 1,600 years, right? And that the Roman Empire was actually A.D. and B.C., right? B.C. and A.D., it was 1,600 years. The United States has only been here roughly about 500 years. And I always think to myself, I don't know any Sumerians. I don't know any Samaritans. I don't know right. any Roman people. I, don't, I know Marcus Aurelius. You know Julius Caesar. You know a few people. But there's a lot of people in that time frame where you don't know what really happened. You have a vague idea. You learned it in school. So legacy has a time frame. Even the people we know today that has legacy, their legacy still have a time frame. Um, mm. Like the, the Martin Luther Kings of the world, the um, J.D. Rockefellers of the world. Like these people, while they have legacy for us in a thousand years, who's to say they're going to be remembered? So that's why it's so impactful and so important that you take the time to make sure that you do something in your lifespan that transcends yourself. So whether that's creative, whether that's business, you want to make sure that you're leaving some nugget beyond yourself. And that's sometimes that's very hard to do in business because you generally tend to find yourself being selfish. But when you invest in your employees and not only from a financial standpoint, but from an education standpoint, from a well-being standpoint, that's going to carry with them, with, with, whether they're not with you and they're 70, 80 years old and they're like, you know, I loved my job. You were that job. <laughs> you know what I mean? You were the yeah. person that allowed them to take off to be able to go to their kids' baseball games. Their kids are going to remember my dad always came to my games. So I want to be them at my kids' games. So legacy is super important and it presents itself in a multitude of ways. Yeah. God, I'm, I, I almost feel like that's a, th that would be like a great note to kind of close on. But, but actually I had, I had another question that, that does relate and it ties a couple of things together. You know, this idea, you know, of legacy and, you know, creating what, what, what sounds to me like a culture of coaching, but this open communication and this investment in the, gro in, in, in the growth of the people around you. So, I wonder if you have any specific suggestions if you were talking to, you know, if we had people, if, if people listening are, you know, thinking of, of either growing, if, you know, I, I know a lot of independent artists who are, you know, looking to bring people on to help them with marketing or sales or that kind of thing. You know, if you were to talk to uh, folks like that or even small businesses, you know, what's one way or, or one piece of advice that you would say that could create that culture of growth? Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of sayings. I have a lot of maxims. So one thing yeah, I always yeah. say, yeah, yeah, I have a lot of, <laughs> so what I always use is empower to excel. And for mm. me, it's really important because, you know, when you have a team, you you don't micromanaging is a huge thing. And and it, as an artist, as a business, you're real sensitive about your work. You're real sensitive. Like that's your baby. Your your work is your baby. Your your um 
business is your baby and you want people to handle it a certain way. And you can, but you always got to remember you hired that person for a reason because they have expertise in some area and you have to let them do their job. You can give them guidance on what's important. You can teach them the standards of your business. You can teach them what your vision is, what your mission is and how to get there. You, you That's what 90 days of training is for. Um, but there becomes a time that you have to let people make mistakes. And mm. that's very hard. That's very hard as an artist, because you, when you're doing an art show and you have a marketer and a marketer sent out the flyers um, two days before and they were supposed to send it out two weeks before, you're going to want to fire that person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're going to be like, no, you got to go. So, so that's a great example, right? That's yeah. a great example. It's like I was thinking about my kids and like I have a 13 year old and and he, you know, we're definitely and, and an eight year old. And we're at the point where like sometimes you like you want to like sort of, you know, keep them in the lane so they don't get, you know, so they don't hit their head or whatever. And sometimes you're like, you know, they got to they got to touch. They got to touch the hot pan and, and learn. Um, but the example you gave is that's even more scary, right? Like if you're, you know, if I'm working with you or even, you know, if you're working for me or we're working together and you have a set of responsibilities, maybe we have a partnership and your work impacts me in a way. I mean, I can imagine that it would be incredibly difficult to, to, to find a, so what would be a different path other, like you want to fire the person you, you, you screwed up, you, you had an impact on my business. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm done. What would be another way to approach that situation? Mark, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the worst example. I'm going to give you the best most terrifying example you've ever heard. So okay. 2019, um, we, um, I was operating at a uh, high level speech and hearing center and um, we had an employee. He was, I was working at the hospital at the time um, and he was interning at the hospital. And then when I transitioned to high level, I felt like he would be a good fit as well. So he wound up coming and working um, at high level. And we kind of implemented some of the systems that we were doing at the hospital. And I trusted him a good bit. And I, I trusted his skill set because I had taught him um, prior to. And at that time, I would say I was not a good leader. I was not a good leader at all. Um, and so I felt what wound up happening was we wound up getting this contract. We had this contract with this school. The contract was worth maybe one point. Five million, and then at the time, um, they wanted us to do additional work. And the work that they wanted us to do, they wanted us to implement therapy for the school. And they told us they had about two hundred kids they needed therapy for every week. It wound up being four hundred kids, so we were severely understaffed to do the work. So I found myself scrambling, trying to find employees. I found myself like trying to do a lot of different things to make it work. What wound up happening with this particular employee was he was doing a lot of the work on his own. He found himself like, you know, and I'm always about team, let the team work. But he was so like, I don't want anybody to mess up what I have going on. This is the system that I built and I'm the only person that knows. So he found himself yeah. working at one, two in the morning doing things. Well, what wound up happening, Mark, was I want to say March of 2020, we wound up losing the contract. And we lost the contract because he had lied about something that he had done that he was supposed to do and he didn't do it. They were requesting information because they had to have it submitted by a certain period of time. And um, he said he was going to have it done. He did not have it done um, in the time frame. And then when we got that email, we not only lost the additional money from the additional work that they wanted us to do, but we lost the original contract. So we're talking about oh. a $2 million annual contract. Yeah. And your first mind tells you, Hey, I want to let him go because <laughs> you know, and, but that my would, second, that would be up there. That would be up there. Yeah. It would definitely be, it would, it, you know, but the thing about it was I stepped back and I looked and when those things happen, I look at myself. I say, you know what? What could I have done? What could I have done better? And you know what? I'm not a good leader at this moment. I'm not where I need to be in order for him to have the success he needs. So for me, I challenged myself to become a better leader. And that was really hard because what I had to do was not only educate myself on leadership, start reading more, get consultants, get people to help me with leadership. I had to reestablish that relationship with him of him seeing me as that leader as well. And mm. that's very, very common with me even dealing with companies now that, you know, have, you know, um, 
many times I'll get places and sometimes the employees have actually lost respect for their mm. leadership. And that generally happens because you say you're going to do something and you don't do what you told them you were going to do. So an example would be in your gallery. If you had an artist come in and you said, OK, we're going to put your stuff here. We're going to do this, this, this and this. Because you have the ability to do it. You said it with good intention, um, but you have so many other things going on and you have so many other people that you want success for right. that you did yeah. not actually get that artist what they needed. And so they start to lose respect for you because you you over you over promise and under deliver um, from your position. And that's and you never want to find yourself in that space. So I'm, I'm always conscious of that. And I always keep a mindset of making sure that not only I'm empowering my team from a stand, not empowering my team from a standpoint of you do the work and I'm not going to, I'm just going to let you do it. And I'm not going to be a part of the work. I empower mm. from a standpoint of I'm knowledgeable about it. I'm here to help you. We are a team. I'm you're not by yourself. I'm not going to do it on my own. We're working on this together, but even though I'm yeah. your boss, Sometimes I can let you, I can lead from behind. I can lead from behind, have you walk in front and then turn back and ask me questions, right? So yeah, which, really which, for me, oh, or really for me empowering to excel, that's really what that means. And and um, I'm really big on that. Yeah, I like that visual. I was actually talking with a, with a coaching client earlier today. And, um, you know, we talked about, you know, different ways of having a conversation where you're eliciting, you know, in the case of business, maybe called voice of customer in our world, it's maybe a, a critique of the work, you know, something that's really intended to help you improve. Um, and, you know, from the from the person who's sort of you know looking for the feedback, maybe it's from the leadership, or maybe it's a 360, right? Like maybe it's going the other way. Um, what's so what's so effective is or the way to, the way that I like to think about it that I'm hearing you say too is you know you're you're not like sending somebody out on their own and good luck you you know you can't call me and you and and you are you know you're leading from whatever position maybe you're leading from behind and you're facing in the same direction so like one of the one of the conversational tools that I offered to to this person earlier today was you know when when if I'm going and I'm and I'm talking to, you know, maybe somebody, you know, who uh, was a client of mine or, you know, somebody who's bought some of my services or bought some of my art, you know, I might, if I wanted to have this kind of conversation with them, I might offer them this framework and say like, look, we, you know, we both want my, you know, if I'm, if you're my boss, I'll say, look, we both want my work to be better. Like, I, you know, that wouldn't that be great. Even if my work is already really good, like, wouldn't it be great if it was better? Okay. So we both are oriented in that direction because that's good for the company, that's good for you. So the format of this conversation that I love, it sort of puts you on the same side of the table is to say, let's, I wanna hear from you what's working really well. Like what, what is working about, you know, maybe I'm on time, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm always showered, I, you know, I get my, you know, I get my work done on time, whatever. And then to say, you know, what are some things that you can think of that would make it even better? So it, it's, it's a less oppositional framework than like, okay, pros, cons, or like what's working, what's not working. But it's more like we're sitting on the same side. We both want you to move forward because when you move forward, all the boats go up, right? So right. what's working well and what are some things that would make it even like that would help me improve, that would help me get even better? So it's less about like, well, you're not doing this the right way. It's more like, well, I think you could, you know, you, you could organ you, if you organize this just a little, if you added that column there, that would actually help improve your speed or, you know, whatever it is. So I, I like that example that you gave because the visual for me is that you're all moving in the same direction. You're moving with them. You're right next to them. You're, the, you're there. You're available. They feel supported, which is, I think is a big, big part of empowerment. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I one other example I'll give you really quickly is yeah. um, I don't I don't know how many um, national football games you've watched. I played football in college. I played football in high school. And there's different coaches for different things. And during the game, there's always a coach that's in the press box and he's up there and he's watching the game from a downward view and kind of seeing what's going on. Um, at halftime, in the in the NFL, there's a lot of interaction between that coach and what's going on um, with the coaches, with the players on the sideline. Um, but generally in high school, sometimes that coach comes down at halftime and tells people what he's seeing and what adjustments he needs them to make. The thing about that particular coach is he has a, a big picture view of what's going on on the field, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when he tells a certain player, hey, I need you to block that guy 
this way. I need you to run the route this way. The response of that player will either be yes, sir, or it will be that they tell that coach why he's having trouble doing that. Because that coach has the big picture perspective and he's not in the woods, like actually on the ground with them, he has to consider what that player is saying because Maybe there's mm. a physical aspect where the player he's going against is stronger than him and what the coach is asking him to do, he can't physically do. Maybe the player mm -hmm. in front of him is faster and he's like, coach, that guy is whooping me every time. Coach, I can't get past him. I know that's what you want me to do, but I'm having trouble doing that. Now the coach, because he still had that big picture perspective, can come up with an alternative solution and have some, and, and he brings the whole team into the solution because the individual solution would not work for that player. So for me, leading from behind looks like that. It's like, hey, this is what I believe you should do. You give me feedback. And then after I get your feedback, we're going to put together a strategy and we're going to go implement that strategy. So yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I love, I love that example. I love that image. You know, you, you, you have, you have somebody whose role it is to look over the whole situation and that's an important role, but it's also important to be whatever that means to you on the field so that you can communicate back and forth and say, okay, you have this idea about a direction. Let me tell you about a couple things here. Go ahead. Tell me what you think we should do to adjust. And and then we, you know, do we execute? I love that. I, I got to close things up here. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I know when we talked before, I, th I think we talked for like an hour and a half. Uh, so I'm, I'm impressed that we're here at 43 minutes. Um, but before we go, uh, I'd love for you to share, you know, if people are interested in finding out more about you and, and what you do, uh, where can they go? So if you want to find out more about me, you can go to, Jamal the Maven on Instagram, um, Jamal the Maven on Facebook and on Twitter, or X. Um, also, I'm launching um, a community, um, the Maven Mastermind. So you can go to m a v e n mastermind.io. Um, in the community, there's a waiting list. At this particular time, you can sign up for the waiting list to join the community. Um, once you join that waiting list, you will actually get. Um, the, one of the first courses, and it's absolutely free, the course is getting your first 100 customers in 90 days. And it's a step-by-step -step guide to getting your first 100 customers for whatever you're doing. Generally, um, a lot of times um, you will get a course and you are supposed to have success with that course. For me, I think courses and community coincide. So it's not just about giving you the information. It's about helping you along. So this community is super important to not only give people information, but let them collaborate and work together to have ultimate success. Success is a team game. It's not an individual mm -hmm. game. You can't have individual success, but even the greatest tennis players in the world have a team behind them, supporting them whenever they actually hit the stage. So my goal and the goal of the Maven Mastermind is to give you that support. Well, Jamal, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a real pleasure to have you here. It's been great, Mark. I really appreciate it. Wow. Thanks for listening, everybody. That was such a great episode, such a great conversation for me. As always, we would love it if you liked this episode, if you rated the podcast, if you subscribed to it, if you shared it with friends. I believe that Unleashing people's creativity and finding ways to do that can change your relationships. It can change your business. And I really believe this. It can change the world. So thanks for listening. And if you ever need to find me, I'm at markchefcoaching.com. That's M-A-R-C-S-C-H-E-F-F coaching.com. I'll see you next time.